a resource. So, um, so I want to I want to share with you because our music is such a gift to give to people. This is what I have found the number one thing I want y'all to to recognize is that every single time I play, people are grateful. Every single time, it's the it's I get as much. You know, it's not just financial that I like to gig because when you play in your house or you're in your own family, it's you're doing it for yourself and the music, but it's a completely different experience when you share it with strangers who love it. They love it. And you realize quickly that this is not a daunting experience because um, of what you are, the gift you're giving them. Because our music is beautiful. Our instruments are beautiful. And we lose sight of that because we're with our harp every single day in our privacy of our homes usually. So um, it's really important, I think, that we share. So um, before we start, I just want to make sure everybody's muted um, during this when I'm talking because so the baby's phone rings or dishwasher or whatever. Just And then at the end, when we have questions, obviously, unmute yourself and then we can talk. Um, so we're going to go just, I have to leave directly in an hour. So I'm going to try and get through everything. Does everybody have this handout? Everybody pretty much. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanted to give you the handout because I don't want you just writing notes. I have a lot of great information for you. And um, the very first thing before you go out and gig is you must have a website and you must have business cards because you are gonna be asked for that first thing. And if you don't have it, you know, it's kind of like, well, that was fun, but bye. So you can go and just get, you know, go to Vista Print or in New Zealand, they probably have an equivalent of a printing store and you can just pick your template. They have all these beautiful things. You can put a photo on there. You can, whatever you want, pick out your business card and get a website. And I recommend one that is going to grow with you. So rather than like there's free websites, like um, I forget what they're called, with Wix. Wix is free. And that's fine for starting out, but you are going to want a website and your and your name. You know, you're going to pick your email, your web address, and you want to stick with it. So go with a music-based site that allows you to download samples of your music. Even if right now you think, oh, I'm so far from that. Get it, because it, you should download a music sample. Just an audio, you can do it off your phone. Put your phone there, record yourself playing. You don't even need a video, just some audio samples. Put your phone there and you know, take three days to get it just the way you want it. And then you can put some audio samples on the website. And so part of this is also figuring out how to make your website. You know, that's the technical side of this, which is another difficult, you know, it's like another jumping stone you have to do. But it's worth it because th that's where everybody's going to find you. And um, I use Banzoogle. I didn't put it in here because I'm not recommending it or not recommending it, but it's a musician's website. And primarily, I think they do like bands that sell tickets and they have fans and whatnot, but it works beautifully and it's not expensive. It's $149 a year. And that includes, they manage my, email address, which I put on the top of this. So I'm www.kimperkins.org. That's mine. I don't have to worry about renewing it or making sure somebody else doesn't get it. They handle that. They do search engine stuff. You know, they do all that. So for me, $149 a year and I upgraded. So, you know, you can get like, you can only put 10 songs on there or you can upgrade and do a hundred songs. So I think I upgraded. I have a hundred songs, you know, that and you can do video, you can do photos, you have multiple tabs to make your website as fancy as you want. And it's just templates. So you just go pick out your template that you like and they have dozens and dozens of, and you just put in pictures of you that you want. So you really personalize it, but they've done all the programming. So it's really just pick out what you like. It's kind of like picking out your business card. And then you just upload the photos or the audio clip and, and they have, chat on there and you ask them and so you, those are two things that are really not daunting don't let that stop you and you must have those before you go out there and you start playing because people are going to say do you have a card do you have a website and so you can hand them your card with your website <laughs> and then you're going to feel great because you're a pro okay so that's what you need first
And um, the mandatory equipment I'm going to show you. So obviously you have your heart and you have a way of transporting your heart. Don't carry it. You're going to hurt your back. So, you know, it take the extra couple of minutes to put it on a cart of some sort. I'm sure you all have figured out how to get your, your, your harps where you need to go and in the back of your car and all this. Um, because I know some people carry their harp and then they end up hurting their backs. And it, it's really true. So um, you must have an amplifier. Get a battery powered one. I had one that was electric. Total waste of money because 99% of the places you're gonna play, you can't, there's no electric. So, and the other thing is if there is electric, the plug is across the room. So you can't have a cord running across the room, people will trip on it. So you battery powered amplifier and a case. A case for your amplifier is as important as the case for your harp because you have to have a way of carrying it without breaking it. And they're not cheap. So I wanna show you, I love this one. It's $500, it's a loud box mini, but you can plug in like if you get to a wedding and the officiant doesn't have a microphone or he has a microphone, but he doesn't have an amplifier. He can plug in with you. I've had this happen multiple times. You save the wedding because they need amplification. Um, so this you recharge, you just plug it in at home and it can go for eight hours and the sound is beautiful. So you can turn it up or down. So you can play, like if you have 200 people and you're on a field, you can, this is, this will handle it. If you have 12 people and you're in a dining room, you just turn it up a little bit and it's beautiful. So I would say you need an amplifier, first thing. The other thing is you're usually gonna be playing outside and you can't hear a harp unless you're standing right next to it outside, you know. So people will say, I can't hear. And then, you know, what can you do? You can't just play louder. So, so you get an amp and then you don't think about it. Um, get a small one and then, um, Okay, and then the other thing that you could use, which I put as is not necessary, but you know, you could, I have a stand for this. So you buy, it's not expensive, like 20 bucks. And you get one of those stands that you see that elevate the amplifier. And I use it if I'm asked to play out in the grass or in dirt or on the beach. Here we have the, we're in Charleston where I play on the beach sometimes because your amp, you don't want it sitting in the dirt or the mud or the wet. So it's not as pretty. It's nicer to just kind of have your amp down at your feet, projecting out, it's very not noticeable, but, um, but that is, oh, okay. But you don't want it out in the dirt, just like you don't want your harp sitting in the dirt, which, um, I'll, which leads me to another thing that's must have. Oh, I didn't get it out of my car, I meant to. All right, in your car, it just lives in your car, is a square thin piece of, it's not even plywood. It's thinner than plywood. You go to Home Depot or Lowe's and they will cut for you. It's this, it's, it's like quarter inch or half an inch thick. And you cut it, you measure the distance that you need that your heart can sit on it plus the front feet of your bench. So your bench and your heart, you cut a square, and I'd say it's about 20 inches by 20 inches. And you put that in your car, like under the mats or something in the back of the trunk. And that way, when you get to your gig and it's on grass, which your heart cannot sit on without falling over, you can put down a flat surface. Or if they say, oh, we want you to set up right here in this dirt, you know, you don't wanna put your harp down in dirt. So you go, oh, I have this thing in my car. And you remember it's in your car because if you take it out of your car, you'll forget to put it back in because you don't need it that much. Because normally people are considered about where they ask a harpist to set up. Not always. So, um, so you, you want that and that is what your harp will sit on if it's in a dirty place. And I always bring a piece of indoor outdoor carpet, some, same from, from Home Depot, a gray nondescript piece of indoor outdoor carpet that fits over that. It overlaps just a little bit. So you're not sitting on a piece of plywood. It just looks a little bit nicer. And I can't tell you, and I roll that up and it goes in my car also, it just lives in the car. I have used just the carpeting 
all the time because even when I go play indoors and it's on tile or wood, I don't like my harp on bare floor because then when you bend it back, I feel like the, you know, you're sitting there for a long time and you're going back and forth and I don't want the legs of my harp rubbing on the, the hard floor. So I just put this little nondescript piece of gray carpeting down and it's, it gives me peace of mind. And it's also easier. It doesn't make noise, your harp sits on. So that, I just think those are essential. Okay, so um, you need a pickup in your harp to plug in to your amplifier. If you don't have a pickup, you need a microphone. And I started with a microphone. You need a microphone stand, which I didn't pull it out because I thought you all understand what that is. And the microphone just pointed at your harp. And then the cord that runs to your amp. And usually your amp is just like a couple feet from you. Um, I have a cord that's 20 feet long. This lives in my bag. This is a wonderful cord. It's wrapped with material. So it, it wraps real nicely. I got it at Guitar Center, I think. Guitar Center is an excellent resource for anything you need. And um, it's not a big plastic heavy thing. It wraps real nicely and it looks nicer across the floor. Not even that much more expensive. Totally worth it. Um, so it lives in my, this is my gig bag. I've had various gig bags, ugly ones, and I discovered, why don't I have a fashionable one? This looks very nice. So everything fits in it. You just, I got it on Amazon, you know, for 15 bucks. So you should have your cords in there. So if you're plugging in from a microphone, you have your cords in there. That way you don't have, you have one gig bag. That's it. If you need a bigger one, get a bigger one. But for me, this works. And because you have your amplifier, you have your music stand, your harp, obviously, and then a bench if you're bringing a bench. And I'll talk to you about that. Um, so Dusty Strings sells a pickup that you can do yourself into your harp. I did the microphone for a couple years and I just found it to be, if you're really gonna be gigging and you really like it and you think this is what I'm gonna do, a pickup just gives better sound and it's so much easier. It's, it's just inside your, your harp. It's in, back in here, my husband glued in the little pieces. They're not even microphones. I don't know how they pick up the sound, but they go all down the harp. And then he drilled a little hole in the bottom. And then this end plugs into the little hole and this end plugs into my amp and I unroll it. It's fantastic. I cannot tell you how it changed my life and dragging around the microphone, the big heavy cords, the stand, and then the sound, you know, isn't even because you, wherever you put your microphone is where you're gonna get the, the loudest sound. So if you're gigging, I would recommend it. And, and Dusty Strings gives you the full step-by-step -step instructions and it'll fit any harp, not just their harps, even though this is a Dusty Strings harp. Um, so you have to have that. You obviously need a music stand. Um, I use peak stands. I just think they fold great and they're sturdy because in weather, you want a sturdy stand because they can blow over. And you, you need to be able to, sometimes you'll have to put a, your foot on your, hold your stand while you're playing. So you need something solid. And those work for me, great. And I have two, one I, I leave at home. Uh, my, mine's right here. And it's just a basic, basic black music stand. And one lives in my car. And that way I don't have to, go back and forth because they're only like $35. So, you know, for $35 for me, I was like, I'm just getting another one. And that way I also have a backup. The other thing that lives in my car is a backup music stand. It's a cheap one. I just have a cheap fold up one, but it's in the car all the time because what if my music stand breaks at a gig? I don't have enough music memorized that I can do that. So, you know, that's a big fear. Um, not a fear. I, I have my music stand, so it's not a fear. Um, the other thing I recommend, if you have a, the way you're gonna to do your sheet music, a lot of people do a binder still. I just recommend if you're gonna do a binder, get a white one so you can do weddings and you put your music in the plastic sheets and you know, you flip through it, close pin it down because wind comes up fast. So make sure you have clothes pins if you're gonna do that. I did that for years. And now the greatest thing I ever discovered was an iPad for music. So you buy one that is 
sheet music size and you get the the four score app i forgot to put this on here but it's essential it's like 20 bucks now and it's four score f o u r i believe score and you download all of your music into this and then you can just put all your your everything is in here it weighs enough that nothing is going to blow away you do not need to be connected to the internet so you can play this remote you know i'm i'm out in the middle of nowhere my music comes up and it's it's rechargeable it lasts for hours so that's another thing in my gig bag um so if you have a gig bag i mean if you have a if you have a sheet a binder make sure you bring the clothespins if you have the uh, ipad make sure you have a page turner this is another this goes with it it's 60 dollars, i think it's a donner page turner i leave it in the box because it's how you keep your equipment nice. You know, if I if I took it out, obviously you take it out to play. But when I'm putting it away, I bring the box and I just put it back because I don't want it to get, you know, ru ruined or you know the buttons are pushed all the time. So this allows you to turn the pages with your foot, so you do not have to keep pushing the electronic page turner, even though you can do it with your hand. And I have a piano player friend who does gigs all the time and she does not want one of these she does it with her finger she just she plays the piano and i don't know i think i find it if i had to, to take a hand off the harp every time to to turn the page it breaks up the music completely so i can't tell you how much i love those two things okay so obviously you need a chair or a stool my recommendation is um can you see my this is a drum form. You see that? So I played for years on those fold up piano benches that you know you bring and they are lightweight and you can just fold them and you bring them on your gig. Um, but my back was starting to hurt if I played a gig longer than an hour. Like if you are asked to do a restaurant for a couple hours or anything for a couple hours your back hurts later and i was thinking it was just the way i was sitting at the harp and then i realized when i practiced at home um on my nice padded stool my back didn't hurt so and then i realized okay i'm gonna bring my nice stool to gigs over an hour it's just that important because otherwise my it's like carrying your harp instead of putting it on the cart take that extra it's kind of a pain but but just do it. So get a good stool, a good padded, something that you are comfortable in. Cause this folds up and I can easily take it. It's just heavier. It's just, you know, it's another thing. So, but it's worth it. So you, you have to have those things. Um, oh, okay. So here's what else I have in my gig bag that I must recommend to you. These are fingerless gloves. When you're playing a wedding and it's a beautiful day and they say and you they said oh play the cocktails also which is you know after the wedding and it starts to turn cooler you and the sun goes down and suddenly it's dropped 30 degrees like it can you still have to sit there and play even though they are all inside where it's warm so you get these fingerless gloves which work and i thought no way i'm not gonna be able to play in these but you can, and it makes all the difference. Uh, <laughs> and I've got them too. Aren't they fabulous? Because you cannot control the weather. So they're in my bag because it's another thing. You can't plan it. It's gonna be, if you need them, you're not gonna have thought to put them in there. So just, they live in my bag. And the other thing that you cannot think about, I leave it in a plastic bag is bug spray. Oh my gosh. I have been eating them live at weddings outdoors. So many of them are outdoors and I, only like the natural bug spray that's what i prefer and it doesn't work it doesn't work you will get that cinnamon flavored or smelly stuff with a lemongrass that they love it and you will be eaten alive and you cannot smack the bugs you're sitting there playing harp i have literally played harp watching the gnats and the mosquitoes eat me alive and i cannot do anything so that's when i think oh i wish i had bug spray so the bug spray lives in my bath so that is so important. And then um, obviously your tuner and you're tuning your wrench and your 
you know, your, your tuning. I leave it in the box. I leave everything in the box. I want it to stay nice. And then your uh, tuning wrench, you know, I keep it in a little bag so it stays nice. Bring a soft cloth. This is what I found here. It's very humid. If you've been playing for 20 minutes outside, let's say you're doing a wedding and you do 30 minutes of prelude typically. You'll do 30 minutes as the guests are arriving before the ceremony. So you're playing and it's humid and sticky and your hands are sweating and your strings feel gunky. So it's not pleasant. So you get out your quick cloth, you just wipe them down and it makes all the difference. So I just, I keep that in there. Um, these are just little things I have learned. In a plastic bag, you put your shoes, your gig shoes. These are my gig shoes. You wear sneakers or a covered shoe or flip flops or whatever it is that is comfortable for you to unload and drag your harp wherever you have to go and put everything there. And then you change into your shoes that you're gonna look nice while you're playing. And here I wore a typical gig outfit um, because I want you to see. Um, so the shoes, I just, then I trade, I put my whatever, I, I, I found the greatest shoes. I used to wear sneakers. And you know, it just really look, doesn't look good. You wear this beautiful outfit and then you wear sneakers. And a couple of times I've gone to a super beautiful wedding and I go in and there's the whole bridal party and there's the bride and I walk in and I say, hi, I'm the harpist. And the first thing she does is look at my shoes. I'm like, no, no, I'm really, I'm gonna change really. But so now um, I don't, I also don't like having to untie and all that. Skechers makes these black slip on, super comfortable shoes. They're like sneakers, but they're loafers. So they're like yoga mat material on the soles. They slip right on and they don't look terrible. So they're comfortable, super comfortable. And when you first walk into a place and they've never met you and they're expecting the harpist and the harp is so beautiful. And, oh, you're gonna have a harp. And there's, there you are in your ugly shoes. It just, I don't know, these things matter. Everything matters to the bride. The bride is like, everything has to be perfect. So I love these shoes. They're, um, they're great. So they're sketchers, they're black. And uh, they're great. So you have to, but don't forget your nice shoes. And you don't have to walk around in your shoes. So if you bring high heels, you sit down, you put on your shoes, you put your, you just walk over and you hide your bag because you never want your bag out where the bride can see. So I hide it behind a bush or a tree or, you know, over the clubhouse might have a little closet, but it's not far. So you hide your bag. You don't have it next to you. And, um, and, then you go sit down. So you're just sitting there in your shoes. It doesn't matter. Although I did discover I have a, a brand of shoes that are so comfortable. They look great. Those shoes look great. And they're comfortable. If you're, if you're playing outside, though, bring a nice pair of ballet flats. Don't wear the Skechers ugly, you know, the loafers. Um, get a pair of dainty, elegant ballet flats, which are terrible for setting up. And even though they look like, oh, that's fine, black flats. But they're just not. They're not supportive. And the sand gets in them. So you know, go ahead and but bring the black ones because if you're playing out in the sand, you don't want to wear heels or in the dirt. So black flats are not for that. And then I just switch my shoes. Um, so that is what is in my gig bag all the time. And a snack. Don't forget a snack. A trail mix, some trail mix or a granola bar. Um, because sometimes you get hungry, you get a sugar low, the bride is not coming and whatever. And if you have to just quickly get a handful of granola, you know, trail mix or whatever. Um, it's better than you sitting there like I'm banished, you know, because sometimes what I find is you get gig energy in the beginning. Like when you're first there, you're setting up and you're nervous and you've got this adrenaline. You don't realize that you need to eat something. So remember, I always, always, even if I'm not hungry, I eat right before the gig starts. So if I'm supposed to start at 4.30, at 4.15, I bring a peanut butter sandwich and I just go and I eat half a peanut butter sandwich, even if I'm not hungry, because I've just learned this, this adrenaline's gonna wear off and I might be starving. So that's me. Bring water. Do not trust the gig to supply you water. And a lot of times if they do, they give you this dripping wet bottle of water they just pulled out of the ice. It's dripping wet. What are you supposed to do with that? You get a drink, you're super thirsty, now your hands are all wet. So you get your cloth, thank God you bring a cloth. I always have this and then you do your hands, but now your cloth is over there by the plant where you've hidden it. 
bring your own bottle of water in those metal things so that they don't get condensation, but they stay cold. And I hide it next to me. I bring a black one. I used to have a turquoise one until one day, one of the brides sent me, because you know that at the photographer, they take pictures of the heart. It's one of the best shots. And they sent me a photo and there's my turquoise water bottle at the bottom. I was like, oh gosh, that looks terrible. So now I've learned I got a black one and I hide it like, behind me a little bit where I'd have to reach for it, but it's not going to get in the shot, the photographer shot. These are little things you learn, but they make a difference. Okay. Um, oh, I put a plastic garbage bag is something that's not necessary. Put a plastic garbage bag in your heart because in your car, because if it's wet and you're transporting, you have to put your harp on your, on your dolly or your trolley and the ground is wet. You can at least put this plastic, like a hefty bag or a, you know, a trash bag down first and put your harp on top of that. So your case doesn't get saturated. Even though there are cases are water resistant, they're just water resistant. You don't want it to get all messy. The other thing, very important, have a towel sitting in your car. A wa I have a washcloth and I have a regular size towel so that when your gig is done and you put your harp back in, wipe your case down right then. Don't wait wipe all the dust and dirt because you're going to have your case hidden also you're going to have to find a place to hide your case and sometimes most of the time you have to zip it and put it outside so it'll get dirt on it so you you can wipe it all off when you get home okay um okay does anybody have any questions so far you can unmute if you do i'm going fast okay um extra eyeglasses I have three pairs of eyeglasses because I wear eyeglasses just to, to read my music. And one time a pair broke and I had to run to my car because they were in my car. Thank God they were in my car. So I keep them in my gig bag. I have two extra pairs in there. Okay, how to get started. Um, playing for free, you have to play for free. Um, is Nancy waiting to come in? Nancy Cock, oh, she's in the waiting room. Do you see her, Gretchen? Okay. Um, getting experienced. Now, the first thing you have to remember is you're going to be nervous. You're going to be nervous. So you want to go play in front of people because the only way you're not going to be nervous is by experience. And it takes years. Don't give yourself a hard time. If you're nervous, you will be. And that's kind of actually part of the whole experience. You get that gig energy and you're nervous and you do it anyway. And you're conquering this kind of fear, but you also want to share. So it's a, it's a wonderful gift. Like I'm telling you, and once you play for people, you are going to see that you are giving them a gift. And it is not about you being nervous. It is about you sharing music they've never heard. They've never seen a Celtic harp. You tell them about the Celtic harp. People want to know, what is that? Do you play with your feet? And you say, no, that's a pedal harp. And you explain the differences and they're fascinated. And it's, I just feel like we're furthering our instrument because so few people know about this particular type of harp. Um, so don't forget every single time you play get photos taken of you because you need them for your website and you're going to need them in the future and this is the opportunity to get them you sitting in places outside or in, inside in different venues not just in your living room so you so make sure you ask somebody on the phone you hand them oh would you mind taking a quick photo they don't mind and um because you're going to want these photos so buskering i cannot tell you if you busker you will conquer your fears so much faster because it's so scary. <laughs> Buskering, to me, I was like, I used to have these ideas when I'd see people playing on the street with tip, for tips. I'd think, oh, those poor people. They're, they're like beggars. But that's not what they're doing. They're, they're sharing their music. And you go to places where people want to hear this. You're not like, you know, you're, you go to nice high class places that would wear a heart fit. So I put, for instance, um, Go to farmer's markets. They love it at farmer's markets. Set up a little, bring it. What I have is a TV tray and you put a tablecloth over it or a drape or a, a folded up sheet, something. You put something white over it and you put your tip jar and it needs to be clear so people can see the money in it, but it needs to be heavy enough that it won't blow over and it needs to not be wide. You need, so that's why people use those wine carafts because they're thin at the top so the money can't blow out. And you put a few dollars in there and you put your cards out 
and on your cards or your website, and you put these things on the table and you sit and you play. You only need about 10 songs if you're buskering when you're first starting, just 10 songs. That's it because you repeat them. It's a cycle and you're just trying to get experience. Excuse me, if you have more than 10 songs, great. But if you only have 10 songs, but you really would like to just feel what it's like to go do, then do it. it people aren't gonna be counting your songs. And the other thing that Buskering does, it's fabulous, is people are gonna stand right in front of you. They stand there and stare at you. It is so hard to play when somebody is standing two feet away and staring at you, but it's the way you're gonna get the experience. And then they take a picture and they're like, oh my gosh. And it's so hard, you will make mistakes because it's totally nerve wracking. They're right in front of you. And you know, as we know as Harpers, if anything walks in your line of sight and it's moving, you lose your place. You're like, oh wait, I can't see my strings because there's somebody walking to the left or to the right. But that's how you get practice. And it doesn't matter if you make mistakes because nobody's paying you. You're doing this for them. And they give you tips and you know, it makes you feel really good. And if you're, at first you feel stupid. You're like, oh God, I look so stupid. But you don't, you don't look stupid at all. You're sharing this beautiful music and people will really enjoy it. Um, so you can go to um, farmer's markets. You can go to like down here in Charleston, we have something called um, Second Sunday and they close off the main part of the historic town and it's just for walking. And, and there's a friend of mine is a cellist and he's an excellent cellist and he buskers during that. He sits on the corner and he buskers and you need a permit to do things like that. I used to do, when I first started playing to get experience, I was living in Santa Fe in, in New Mexico and Santa Fe is this total artsy community, you know, with tourists. And they have a farmer's market at the train station, I think once a month. And I got a permit from the city and I would go there and I would busker. And it was nerve wracking, but I felt so empowered that I did it and it was great. And people liked it. And if you make 30 bucks, you're happy. You know, you sit there as long as you want. Nobody's got the time schedule on you. And you, it's just a great feeling. And you will learn so much. You will learn also because people will talk to you while you're playing. That's a very difficult skill. Talking and playing, very difficult. But if you stop every single time to talk to somebody, you're hardly playing because they're going to they're going to talk to you. So you kind of say, uh huh, uh huh. Or, oh, thank you, because they'll say, oh, that sounds nice. Or what's the name of that song? And you go, oh, this is and then you make a total mistake and you have to start over. And then you, know, you will learn how to do this, how to handle it by just doing it. You know, there's no class that can teach you that. Nothing. So you can go to farmers markets. You can go to um, the to the to the artsy communities to a, to the to art fairs you know I did it at an art fair too my very first bus screen was at an art fair you know one of those weekend things and um I just set up a canopy over me and I didn't put out tips I didn't want tips because this was my first thing and I literally had nine songs that's all I knew that I I knew well enough that I could feel I could play and I was I just did it and it was great I didn't want anything for it so um, I can't, I can't, that is, I really recommend doing that. Um, the other thing you, you definitely can get experience volunteering at assisted living places. Don't go to the nice ones because the nice ones you're going to want to go to when you have experience and you're going to want to get paid there. So go to the lower end ones that don't have the budget to hire a harpist or a musician. So you, you can research and you'll find out, you know, they rate these assisted living and aid over you know, 55 or the mental people who have dementia and whatnot, they love volunteers to come in and play for them. They love it. They will welcome you. And if you go in once a month on a regular basis, say, I'd like to come in once a month and you set yourself up, you know, every month for maybe you go in four times and you try it. Um, the thing with, that is very funny with assisted living is they all gather around. They pull up their chairs. This is a huge event for them. So you think, oh, I'm just going to be playing in the background while they're doing their crafts or whatever. No. They pull their chairs right up to you. They can't hear real well. So you have to turn your amplifier up way louder than you normally think you should. And they talk to you. They sit there and stare at you. It's an audience and they're seated. So it's different than bus ring where they're kind of walking around. They're not staring at you for the whole hour. These, they stare at you like it's a concert. Another excellent experience. Excellent. Because you are on show. You are presenting. And 
And this is the case where you don't want to have just nine songs because you're going to be playing for, say, an hour. So you might have, I don't know, 15 songs because you can repeat. They won't remember. And, um, and it gives you wonderful experience. Wonderful, wonderful experience. And they appreciate it so much. But like I said, go to the lower end ones because this is an excellent opportunity for, for getting paid later. And I play um, all the time at very nice assisted living facilities. Um, the other place is bridal fairs. Volunteer, say, I will play at your fair if you will waive the fee. So a lot of times it's like $250 for a booth at a bridal fair. And you think that's a lot of money, but what if I get all these harp gigs. Well, my experience is usually we'll get two and two is not really enough to because you have to pay the $250 and it's all your time. And it's a Saturday. You may have given up. Somebody may actually hire you later and say, oh, could you do this day? I'd like to hire you. And you can't because you're doing this free bridal fair. So, or, you know, you're hoping to get something. So see if they will hire you. Just say, I will play in exchange for a small booth. And what they mean by booth is a space. It's nothing. Bring your table, your TV table again, just like you did for buskering, put your cloth over it, your cards, your, you don't do tips because this is a different thing. And you can make postcards up like a Vista print or whatever they can make the four by six or the five by eight, whatever size you want postcards that say 15% off weddings if you book today or if you mention this bridal fair. So then now you have a little thing for them to read. They take your postcard, because all these brides are walking through, and usually there's no harp. I've never been to a, a bridal fair where um, there was another harp, and I have played four or five bride, bridal fairs, um, so I've done five, I think, five bridal fairs, and I found it to be excellent experience, and I only paid for one because a friend of mine put it on, and I was kind of, I did get two gigs out of that one, but it was two, you know, it wasn't really worth my, my time, but the other ones I got two gigs out of and I hadn't paid. So that was great. <laughs> so if you have to pay for a booth, you really have to balance whether it's going to be worth it, but it's excellent experience. And at the bridal fair, you play bridal music, which brings me to repertoire. This book, the Lori Riley and Beth Cole book about um, wedding music is fabulous for learning, getting some, just some basic, typical wedding music in your fingertips, because you need to have certain things that you know how to play that are appropriate for weddings. So like here, here comes the bride, canon in D, trumpet tune, Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring. These are standards and they will be asked of you. There's two, there's bridal, bridal march and there's bridal um, wedding march. So there's Mendelssohn's and then there's the other one. Oh, I can't remember the name, but those are the two and they're all in that book. So you go to the bridal fair. Oh, somebody's waiting to come in. You see her, Gretchen? And um, at the bridal fair, you only need to play those tunes over and over and over. You can play your other stuff too, just to give them an idea um, of you. You know, you play them your other stuff, but you make sure you play Here Comes the Bride and Canon and D and Hazu. And you, you play that every like 15 minutes. So it's not real hard because you don't need a huge repertoire to go to a, a bridal fair. And no, you don't need to worry like, oh, I don't have enough songs for the actual wedding if they book me. Because that will come. You'll, you, they'll tell you what they want you to learn. And they always book like months in advance. So you'll have time. So to the actual bridal fair or the actual, you know, where you're advertising yourself, your, your music, just get a few of these basics under your fingertips. Um, Libraries are an excellent place to play for free. Go to libraries. They have a meeting room usually and say that you would like to play the Celtic harp. They will love that. I now get paid to go to libraries, um, but you start out, you can offer your services and then they'll advertise it and people will come and they will sit. So you just have to be prepared for a more of an audience type thing rather than you're playing in the background. Um, and local art, Openings. I played in an art gallery when we were in New when living in New Mexico. Once a month, there was a local art show. It was at a library, and I volunteered and I played for a year and a half every month for free, and it was great experience. Because now it's more of a cocktail party kind of environment, which I happen to really like. Because you're playing, 
but people are walking around and they're having snacks and they're looking at the art or whatever they're doing. If they're in a wedding, they're talking to each other. So you're providing ambiance rather than the main attraction. So there's these different types of gigging where you're the main attraction and where you're providing ambiance. And you know, it's good to get practice in both. Um, and also don't think you need fancy arrangements of this music. Um, Lori Riley wrote in her blog that she had a friend who played, she was in a competition and she played the um, dulcimer, the hammered dulcimer. And she wasn't very experienced at it, but she entered this competition with all these super experienced people who did these super fancy arrangements. She just played simply and beautifully because she just knew what she knew and she came in second place. And it's, I always think of that, like if I'm trying to play this super fancy arrangement, um, it's, and I'm not as good at that as a simple arrangement of the same tune, people appreciate and hear the simplicity and how well you play it because you know you can present this beautifully. Now, sure, if you know how to play a fancy arrangement and that's something you love, great, but don't feel like, oh, I'm not ready to play in public until it's, you know, the, the you're not giving a concert. You know, that's the thing about gigging. This isn't a concert. You're not like being paid to go on tour and you have a set 45 minute repertoire that's the best ever. And you're gonna be critiqued on this. No, you are providing beautiful music and you don't have to think this needs to be super fancy. Um, okay, so getting, now you're gonna be paid. Do not play for, for your friend's weddings. When you, it says, like in these, in these wedding books, it says, how do you get experience playing weddings? Because, you know, you have to be confident enough to play a wedding, but how do you get the experience to do it? Don't, it says, see if your friends will let you play at their weddings. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have that many friends getting married and I don't want to mess up their wedding because I'm practicing by playing my heart. So don't do that um, because you'll be more nervous. Um, so the first thing you do, if you're, if you're ready to go out there and gig, Go to Wedding Wire and The Knot, which are two American websites. I'm sure you know, they have stuff there. Um, and if you're already gigging and you don't have these sites, you're not on these sites, definitely put yourself on there. You can get a free one, they're called Light. Um, you don't have to pay for this. I've done both. I've paid for a spot and I've gone Light. I'm on Light now because I got the same exact amount of bookings when I paid. So that's obviously not gonna work. And it's because I play the harp. Now, if I was a violinist or a pianist where there's 25 violinists, then you might wanna do something like you pay for the performance spotlight, but you don't need to as a heart because you will go in there and you'll check, you'll go to Wedding Wire. These are these bride, bride search for these, for musicians on these sites they are very popular. And um, you'll find how many harpists there are and you'll see there's none. <laughs> there might be pedal harpists and if there's any pedal harpists out there, that's great. Um, but I mean, here on the, doing this today, but there's just, I, there's none in Charleston on there except for me. So why would I pay? So, so I don't need to pay. And um, you need to get your photos, all these photos that you've had taken of you for free while you're playing for free. Now is a chance that you're going to post them because you need to post at least 15 photos. The brides are, they're clicking through all the photos. They want to see, oh, where is she playing? Where, what kind of, what does she look like playing? Da, da, da. So the more photos you have in different venues, even if they aren't weddings, that doesn't matter. They don't know where they are. You just put pictures of you playing in different locations where you've had people take pictures of you playing. Um, and so you have all these different locations. Look, I'm, I've got all this experience and you never tell somebody, this is my first wedding. You don't tell them that um, because they don't, you're going to do great. Um, and I'll tell you something that Anne Roos, who wrote this wonderful book called the, the Wedding Musician's Handbook, and it's a great resource. Um, she wrote something that really has helped me. You are not the star at a wedding. You're the background. So you may get super nervous when you're playing a wedding. And it's important to remember, you're not the star. And that, that's a huge relief. They're not staring at you. They're staring at the bride. So it's, it's like when you're buskering, they are staring at you. But when you're playing a wedding, you're providing the ambiance so the bride can be the star. So it's, it's a huge relief off of you. It's a pressure off of you. You need to look good. Now, this is what I wore this so that you could kind of see, I don't know, it's a, it's a dress, but you never want to show your bare arms. You wear something over it. 
This is summer, so this is something cool. In the winter, I would wear something a little longer sleeve. Um, you wear like simple pearls. You don't ever wanna be the star. You don't wear a low cut shirt. Um, you are the background and you'll see it at, when you go to weddings or art galleries or places where, or restaurants, the vendors, and you are considered a vendor when you were hired, wears black. They fade into the background. It's like in the orchestra, the musicians wear black. You're listening to the music. You're not looking at the musician. And I think that's important, but you want to look as beautiful as you can because you are playing beautiful music on your beautiful heart. So you, you put makeup on, put some lipstick on, a little mascara. I fluff my hair up much more than I do when I'm just going to the grocery store. Um, you know, I make sure I put some eyeshadow on and you know, I don't have blue eyeshadow, look at me. It's very subtle. It's, and I put a little powder on my cheeks. I just want to look, I wanna do my harp justice and I want the bride to feel like, you know, she's getting her money's worth. They pay a lot of money for a vendor and you wanna look professional, attractive and professional. When you see like, for instance, photographers, I'll see photographers at weddings, they're supposed to wear black. They're supposed to blend in. And I'll see like these women photographers, they wear a little mini skirt. Like this is completely inappropriate, not acceptable. But you know, that's why I tell people, I mean, I wanted to tell you, show you. So, cause some, everybody has a different idea of what's appropriate, you know, always wear a dress that goes three quarter lengths, you know, not to the knee because when you spread your legs, obviously in your heart, it's not gonna be appropriate if anybody's seeing you from the side and God forbid the wind blows up at a wedding and your dress goes up, it's just not appropriate. So um, pants, I always wear a skirt, I like it. And if it's freezing cold, I wear fleece leggings that are black under my skirt and I pull them up just to my shin so that they can't be seen, but they keep me warm. I have worn pants and I just don't think it's as feminine and it's the harp is so feminine. I, I don't, I wanna do my harp justice, you know? I play with people like violinists and they'll wear pants and I just, you know, women. And I, I just think it looks more appropriate, um, but that's me. Okay. Oh, this is the best thing. Okay, how do you do, what, how do you get practice at a wedding? Okay, I got booked at a bridal fair, my first bridal fair in New Mexico. I played this bridal fair for free. You know, I didn't, I didn't have to pay for it, but I pay, but I play, which I wanted to do anyway. I wanted to play this where you're going to get experience. And I got booked for a wedding and she asked for Canon and D, which I do. That was one of my least favorite tunes. So this was a difficult thing for me. Um, and weddings will never go as they're planned. Never, never, ever think, oh, this is going to go like this, this, and this. Never. So the bride tells me that that she's gonna walk from a certain spot. So I planned kind of, okay, this is how much music of Canon and D I'm gonna need to play. She didn't do that. She walked from three times further away at the actual wedding day. I completely messed up because I wasn't ready and she was not where she was supposed to be. and I wasn't ready and I just, but the important thing is do not stop playing. Even if you were like, oh my God, you just keep playing something and you play it in the same beat. You just keep going. It's okay, but don't stop and don't freak out because it's going to happen. You are going to make mistakes. So I just kept playing the canon in the same rhythmic tune until I found my place. And afterwards I said to the mother of the bride, um, did you notice, how did it sound? She goes, well, there was quite a bit of confusion. There. I said, yes, there was, I'm sorry about that. They didn't care and they invited me to the wedding. I mean, you know, you're just gracious about it and they were fine. And so to get the experience, this is what you, this is what I put on my little cards at the bridal fairs. I would throw in the rehearsal dinner for free. So, you know, there's a rehearsal the night before the wedding, all weddings, all these big weddings. Um, and they usually do not hire the musician to come because they have to pay extra to have them come. You offer to come because you will get the experience. You get a dress rehearsal for what the wedding is going to be. You get to picture exactly what it's going to be. And the most stressful thing about beginning to play weddings isn't the music. Because you practice the music. You know the music. It's imagining where is it going to be? Where am I going to sit? What's it going to be like? How am I going to, when do I start? When do I stop? 
It's all the imaginings of the unknowns. That is the part that is stressful. When I get there, where am I going to unload my car? How far is it going to be to the to the where the bride is going to be? Where do I sit? Who's going to tell me where to sit? So there's two things you do. You throw in a visit to the venue for free. You offer. As part of my wonderful services, I visit your venue first for free, and I will do it within the month before your wedding. Oh my gosh, thank God for this. Because, and they say, oh wow, she's so great. She'll go to the venue for free. So you go to the venue and you make an appointment with the event coordinator. There's always an event coordinator at a venue. And you, you set up a time, you go. She shows you where you're gonna sit. You see, you, she shows you how to load and unload. Where are you gonna park to unload your car? Then where do you have to move your car to? Then when you come back, do you go to the same place? These questions that are stressful. And then she's going to show you where are you going to store your stuff? You're going to unload your, your, all the stuff you have case, you have your heart case, you have your heart trolley. You know, you have all this stuff. Where are you going to put it so that it's not in the way of the wedding? You, you take care of all this with them. So then um, you know what to expect exactly. And the bride thinks you're hot because you have done this above and beyond for the same price. Then you go to the rehearsal. Now you've practiced exactly. You know totally what to expect. So it's like you get to two weddings in one so this is the best thing and you do that for as long as you need to you know if you want to do that for i don't know the first dozen weddings that you do do it you do it as long as you want to do it there's no problem and i stopped doing i don't remember i think i did a dozen weddings or 10 weddings before i finally said i don't need to visit the venue anymore I, they're pretty you get the feel of it you, you get to know like it works out and you and i don't need to do the rehearsal because now i've done enough it's they pretty much follow the exact same format it's just different music and different people, but they all follow the exact same format. So you'll get to know that. So um, that's how you get wedding practice. You just do it. And okay, so the other places to play and be paid. Nice assisted living, contact the social director. They change every six months or so. It's a very high turnover place, um, job I mean. So every six months, reach out, email, go meet them, give them your card, give them your website. Ask them to say, I play at a bit, and you, lots of them will want you to, especially Christmas time. Uh, restaurants, Sunday brunch, perfect for heart. Go to the restaurant manager, give them your card, tell them you would like to play for, um, for their brunch. And private parties, once you get known, and on Wedding Wire, this is the thing. If you're on Wedding Wire and on The Knot, when people do the Google search for a harpist in your area, your name comes up. So it's not just brides that are going to see you. People who are looking for a harpist for their private party, they see you on Wedding Wire and they'll contact you. Just not, not just for wedding. Okay, art openings, but now you get paid. So you go to nice galleries, you offer that. Christmas time, St. Patrick's Day, Mother's Day. You should have gigs. Once you have a website and you're on these sites where people can find you, these are the most popular days. Um, go to wedding planners. If you want to, wedding planners, I didn't know this but they are the ones who direct at all their brides to their vendors most of the time. So on Wedding Wire, if you go not as, a, not as you putting on your site, go search wedding planners and you'll see pages and pages of them. Send them your contact information. I play harp in your area, I would love to help your brides. And, um, and send them your rates. They're gonna wanna know what your rates are, you send them your rates. Um, music agencies, there's a lot of music placement agencies. A lot of music, uh, wedding planners will contact agencies. You contact them. You give them your information. You say, I'm a harpist in this area. I'd love to play for you. I play for four different agencies. You're not hired onto them. You're an independent contractor. And when they have a job, when somebody contacts them and said, I need a harpist, they call you. So these are music agencies, um, restaurants, like I said. And OK, um, repertoire. If you don't know how to lead, read a lead sheet, you should learn fake books. This is the easiest one, Louise Trotter, so easy. She's got wonderful songs in here, Moon River and uh, La Vie en Rose. These are songs that you're gonna need to play at cocktail parties, at wedding cocktail parties, at cocktail parties in general. And if you know how to read a fake book, you can play with other people very quickly and easily. Christmas, this is Sylvia Woods, she puts in the chord names for all her songs. So if you want to just play lead sheet music from this, it's so easy if you just want to follow the melody line and you don't really know the song well, but you've got 
all of your chords written in here. So at Christmas time, if somebody you know, said, oh, in two weeks we want you for a Christmas party and you're not really, oh, you don't wanna say no. So you get some lead sheet Christmas music and you know how to do it. Okay. This is the wedding and, and love. This is the Chris, this is wedding music musicians Bible. I think there's six editions of this now. I have the second edition, oh, fifth edition. And there's 500 songs. Pretty much any song a bride requests, you'll find. And it's all in lead sheet versions. So you can play it like if you're supposed to play with a violin, the violin will play the melody and you're gonna do the chords and your chords are there for you. So it's, the, the faith books are so helpful for when it has to be, you don't have much time to learn it or you're gonna play with another musician. Um, okay, pricing, I can't help you with that because it's different in every single area. I happen to live in the second largest wedding market in the country. So brides are gonna pay a lot of money for weddings. When I lived in New Mexico, I charged a third of what I'm getting now because there was no economy. And I was brand new and I felt like this is what I, so I would go to the rehearsal, I would go to the venue and I would do it for $150. And you know, it was like, I wasn't making any profit really, but I didn't care. And um, once you're there, offer the cocktail hour for an extra hours. So like if they say, we want you to do our ceremony, say, okay, would you like me to do the cocktail hour also? It's, it'll only cost you an extra hour and you know, whatever your fee is per hour in your region. And they'll usually say, oh yeah, that's a good deal because a wedding costs a certain amount and there's a lump sum. It includes 30 minutes of prelude. So make sure you tell them that it includes amplification. It includes your heart fee for bringing it in the transportation of loading it and unloading it. It includes, they get to choose the music for their ceremony, not all the prelude music. Don't let them choose that. Now you're learning 20 new songs. No, they get to choose their five tunes for their wedding. You say in your contract, because that's a whole other, Mary's got that in her business seminar. You need a contract and you're going to say that you will play from your repertoire for cocktails, if you're doing cocktails and prelude. They can choose the songs for the ceremony. And I do not charge extra if they want to, me to learn a song, but I know a lot of people do. They'll charge like $25 if, if you're going to learn a song. So that's up to you. Um, so it's going to be different. An hourly fee is different than a heart a wedding fee because there's a ceremony set fee and it's much higher than it would be because you only play for about an hour at a wedding, but you're not charging for an hour of your time. You're charging for a ceremony fee. So you have to go and find that out by kind of pretending you're a bride and calling musicians and seeing what they charge. Harps are different than a violin because there's a harp fee for transporting, it's usually 75 to $100 just to get the harp there. Then your fee starts on top of that, your hourly fee. Now I know musical agencies out here, place, they pay $60 an hour once you're there, but then the music agency charges 40%. So she's getting $100 an hour, like at an assisted living place, she'll pay me $60 an hour. She'll pay me $90 to get the harp there. Then she'll pay me $60 an hour, but she's charging another 40. So she's charging them $100. So, but on weddings with the same musical agency, she, she pays me exactly what I would charge without an agent. So, you know, you have to think about it. Don't undercut the money because you're trying to get started. You don't want to think, oh, well, they charge 125 an hour. I'm going to charge 80. That's the big one for the big. You don't want to undercut the market because then you're shooting yourself in the foot is what you're going to end up doing. Okay. For a tire, don't go and buy yourself all new, beautiful, brand new stuff. Go to the consignment stores. Uh, all my stuff is from consignment stores. And if you don't like to go shopping, go to swap.com or they have these online thrift stores now, which I love because I don't like shopping. Um, and you can always get away. If you don't know what to wear, wear black. And I don't wear black to assisted living because I think it's a little morbid, but I will wear a black skirt and like a pink blouse. Um, if it's Mother's Day, I wear pastels. If it's Christmas time, I wear red and green. So, you know, you can dress appropriately. And like, I'm doing a wedding Thursday. She said, all white. She wants me to wear all white. All the vendors are wearing all white. Normally, never ever wear white to a wedding. Not like as an undershirt, you have a little, or a white, you have one of these that's white. I have one of these that's white that I play at the hotel where I play. Never to a wedding. Never wear ivory or white. You 
you're not the star and you don't want anybody <laughs> looking at you and saying, oh, she wore white. Okay, load your car and unload it exactly the same every single time. You're gonna be all like, oh, oh, you're in a panic. You're all, you're at your gig. Oh, I gotta get everything out. Okay, get everything out. But when it's time to go, when you're exhausted and you're so, oh, I did it. You're so proud of yourself. Put it back in exactly the way you load it. Wipe down your harp case, wrap your cords up as you go. Don't just throw your cords in your gig bag. Wrap them up because you're not gonna to wanna to do it when you're home and you want to take care of your stuff. You want it to be cleaned, nice, put away nice. And just do it as you go. It's, you'll be very glad. Um, and the consistent habits will keep you from forgetting things. Because at first you'll make a, make a checklist for yourself and you put it by the door. Everything that you need in your gig bag. Make sure you didn't forget anything. God forbid you forget your shoes. I mean, you look terrible if you're wearing sneakers, you know? So you have a checklist by the door. Did I get everything? And if you consistently load your bag the same, you consistently load your car, your car the same. Like my car, everything has a spot in my car. This is where the amp goes. This is where the harp goes. This is where my stool goes. It's, it's how I do it every time. And then I know I can just look it over and I know I got it. I'm not like, well, where, where did I put my music down? Oh, it's today it's underneath the seat here. You know, no, do it the same methodically. And Alison Vardy, who is a Seattle harpist, or not Seattle, she's in Canada. She, on her blog, she wrote something that I pinned up on my wall and I couldn't find it. But in her blog, she wrote this all about when you're first starting to gig and you're so nervous, you have so many, you're trying to make sure you got everything and your music is good and you look good and you, you're, it's very nerve wracking. And she wrote, remember, it's a harp. They're going to love it. And she, then she would write a few more things. Remember, it's a heart. They're gonna love it. She'd write a few more things at the end. Remember, it's a heart. And it's absolutely true. People are not gonna notice the mistakes you make. They are not gonna be unforgiving. It's wonderful. And do not draw attention to mistakes. Do not go, oh, oh whoops, or start over. Or like I said, you know, I did that like, canon and D and I was totally all over the place, but I didn't stop. Never give away the fact that you're making mistakes and you are going to make mistakes. I play at this hotel for three hours. I have two shifts a week and I play three hours a shift. There's no way I'm going to play for three hours and not make mistakes. I get tired. I don't know my music. I don't know three hours of music perfectly. So what I do is now I use that as an opportunity because playing in front of people is the best practice of all. So I'll, I'll bring like, oh, I'm, I've been working on this at home and I really want to get better at it and see how it sounds. And I'll play it in front of people because they don't know. And like right now I'm working on Jamie Come Try Me, which I just love it. And playing it in front of them, which they don't know what it's supposed to sound like. And it's, and I just, the mistakes that I make in it, I just go over them. And I, and sometimes I'm like, oh, that sounded pretty good, actually. That's a new thing. Maybe I'll keep that. And I'm, that's how I get practice. And I have learned to make mistakes playing in front of people. And I'm not scared of it now. You're going to make mistakes. Don't draw attention. Just keep going. Nobody will notice. They won't. Okay, quick. Anybody questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> If anyone wants to unmute and ask a question, you covered so much. I don't know that anyone's going to have any questions. I know. I put my, my email address on there because you're going to have questions maybe later, and I'm happy to answer anything if you have any questions. I have one. I have one. Eileen, <laughs> do you still wear a mask when you're uh -huh. at um, nursing homes or anything? Uh, the nursing homes here, you wear a mask when you check in. So you go into a desk at a nursing home. These, these places are like five-star hotels. They're so beautiful. And you sign in and you wear a mask and then you go up to the restaurant. I, I usually play at restaurants, like over their dinner. You know, what, I have a monthly gig I do right now every month and I play for two hours of their dinner. And as soon as you sit down, you take off your mask. Okay. And none of them wear a mask. And none of the, this happens to be where we are in South Carolina. It's very... All the laws have been lifted and even there um but it's it's whatever the the facility asks you to do I would okay do. okay thank you yeah 
Uh, does Ken Thomas have a question? I see a hand raised. Yes, I do. Thank you. I was just wondering, what is your favorite version of the canon? Oh, sorry, I forgot I have my, my mic down. What is your favorite? I, I, there's so many different versions of canon out there. Yeah. What just happens to be your favorite? So I took two versions and combined them. I took the one from the Lori Muse from Lori Riley's book from this one, and um, I did. I took I divided because it it's divided into sections. So I took one section of this, like the first and third section, and then I just put it with another one. I can't even remember where I found it, and I play that because. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I just want to add one thing that uh, I, you did mention and that I have, and it's just a portable ramp. And it's great for like, yeah, it's it's great for the trolley yeah. Um, and getting in and out of the house. It, it handles like one or two steps up. Yeah. And if you don't have somebody assisting you, it's just great to have. It's yeah. portable ramp, I got it on Amazon. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We have somebody who wants to know what the name brand of your foot pedal is. You're the page oh. turner, I think. D-O-N-N-E-R. I did so much research on all of my equipment. So this was the one that kept coming up and I'm very pleased with it. You can do half page turns, you can go backwards, you can, you can do all kinds of things with it. Hi Kim, uh, Stephanie here. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard someone mention bringing the contract with you when you come to the gig also, just so that it can be right there and you can show the parties if anything happens. Do you usually bring the contract? I used to. I have never once. I have done probably a hundred weddings and I have never been asked any problems. There's never been a problem. Now, the, the only thing that I could say is that sometimes people start late. It's, it only happened a few times. Like one wedding started an hour late because the parents weren't there. So, you know, I have a contract and I could technically go back and say, I'm going to charge you for that hour. And some people do. Um, and hopefully they will by themselves tip you for that hour. And I had just have never because it's a wedding. It's joyful. I don't want to be legal like that, you know. And I haven't needed to. People are, it's a wonderful, people are happy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Someone would like to know how early you usually arrive at a gig. Oh, that's an excellent question. So never ever cut it close. I would much rather be 15 minutes early than 10 minutes, like too ready to go right as it starts. So I leave, if I don't know the venue, I plan on arriving an hour before I'm set to play. And if I know the venue, then I know exactly how much time I need. But like for now, I play at a hotel twice a week, like I said, and I still get there 45 minutes before I'm set to play. So I'm, I'm already ready to go always like 12 minutes before I'm set, but I prefer that because, you know, I don't like being stressed out and being running late. What if there's traffic or what if the car breaks down? You never know. Melissa, did you get your question answered? Melissa White? I saw your hand up. Oh, yeah, that was my question to see how early you get there because it's like multiple trips back and forth from the car and it seems like a big process. Give yourself plenty of time and also your stress. You don't, who cares if you get there and you sit there for an, a half an hour? You know, you can walk around, you can warm up a little bit without turning on the amplifier. Before you turn on your amp, you can play without people hearing you. So I would much rather be early. Oh, always wash your hands before you start tuning. You go and you set up. Don't forget to wash your hands. I always set up. It's kind of like my little ritual. I'm ready. I go to the bathroom and I wash my hands and then I come back and just, I have to go. But I want to tell you one last thing. Sometimes there's no bathroom. I went to a wedding, oh, a month ago. It was at the 12th hole of the golf course. The 12th hole of the golf course, there's no bathroom. It was in the middle of nowhere. It was on this beautiful marsh, but it was, there was nothing. So I'm out there setting up. They led me to where it was supposed to be in the golf cart and I followed them and I had to literally go off road with my car. I unloaded everything. There's no bathroom. And I had been driving two hours to get there because I, you have to decide how long you're willing to drive. I will drive two hours and you get paid for your time. You have to set all that up. You know, you figure all that out. Um, I had to go to the bathroom in the bushes. You know, there was nobody there. So there, but you know, you have to, you have to hike up your beautiful dress and you have to do what you have to do. And then that's why you have wipes in your bag. Then you have wipes 
and you wipe your hands and you make sure they're as clean as you can before you touch those strings so that you don't have to clean them later, your strings. So you have to roll with it. You definitely have to be flexible. Do not get in this mindset that if things don't go exactly as you planned, it's a failure. It will never go exactly as you planned and you are there to help this bride have a beautiful day and or whatever the gig is. If you're hired for a party and the, they want this beautiful party, you're there to help that happen. And, and you just do it. And it's, it's a wonderful, joyful thing that you can give to people. So, well, please email me if you have any other questions, I'm very happy to answer. And I, I wish you all the luck and just go out there and do it. You'll love it. Thanks, Kim, very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, we really appreciate it. And I okay. guess we'll all sign off now, huh? Okay. Enjoy the rest Thank of you, Mary. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it.